Reinvention is the key to overcome new challenges and keep growing. Welcome to South Summit 2020. A new networking platform with a revolutionary live TV format to access and connect from any device, anytime and anywhere. Join South Summit 2020 and multiply your business opportunities. Hola and welcome to day three of South Summit 100. My name is Oshin Lunny and I'm thrilled to be your host for the next 90 minutes of exciting startup, scale up and unicorn action in the category of consumer trends. We've had two thrilling days already of the most exciting tech pitches and inspiring conversations. And today South Summit will be welcoming tech VIPs and thought leaders from the global ecosystem to share their insights and predictions on our high-tech hybrid stage right here in La Nave in Madrid. And we will also be challenging 11 smoking hot startups uh, to battle it out in front of our panel of extra judges in the category of consumer trends. And don't forget that the, the pitch who wins this competition will go through to the final, which is happening later today, where there can only be one winner for the grand prize. And don't forget, you can also tune in today to two brilliant parallel tracks which are happening right now. Uh, and these are fintech and travel and tourism. And make sure to remember to join our prime time session later today, where you're going to hear from leaders like Nick Nash, Katie Coleman, Carlos Sanz, and others. So don't miss it. Now, we're here here in Madrid on this eighth year of South Summit, but it's been a pretty interesting year, so we're doing it differently. Um, as those who've joined us for the past few days will know, we've pivoted and made this into an interactive TV experience. Uh, so it's very exciting, but we're not just here in Madrid. We're also in New York, Singapore, Buenos Aires, Milan, London, Barcelona, and San Francisco. South Summit this year is more global than ever, and everyone is connected. So today we're going to be covering four really exciting areas, and they are gaming, personalization, real estate, and virtual worlds. And virtual worlds and gaming have both been really in the news recently, with a Travis Scott appearance in the virtual world in the Battle Royale game of Fortnite, which attracted over 12 million viewers for a performance in this virtual world. And our opening conversation is between two very brilliant thought leaders, one of whom I used to work with many moons ago in the virtual world of Habbo Hotel, which is a real pioneer in the space. At one stage, Habbo Hotel had more items for furniture for sale than IKEA, and they welcomed celebrities like Justin Bieber, Calvin Harris, and Miley Cyrus into their virtual avatar-driven world. He just sold his company, Small Giant Games, for over $1 billion. That's a real major EU success story. And yes, I told you, we promised you unicorns, and here they are. So amigos, please welcome to the South Summit virtual stage for our first session of the day, two gentlemen who can see into the future and are very kindly sharing their insights with us here. Welcome to the stage, Timo Soininen from Small Giant Games and Sean Setton Rogers from Pro Founders. How are you both? Very, very good. good. I, feel I feel like, like this is Eurovision, Eurovision coming, coming at you live, live from London. London. Very <laughs> exciting, exciting stuff. stuff. Awesome. Timo, how are you? I'm really good. Uh, great to see you, Oisin. It's been a while. We used to work together back in the day, so it's, it's great to see you. And, uh, very happy to be here. Lovely to see you, Timo. Great to meet you, Sean. And Timo, I follow your updates. It's been such a joy to follow everything you've been doing over the past uh, 10 years. Um, so, guys, I'm going to leave you to it. Sean, you're joining our jury later on, but I'm sure you have some great questions for Timo in the meantime. Take it away. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. So, as we said, my name is Sean. I'm with ProFounders Capital. We are a venture capital fund based in London. We write checks from half a million to a million and a half euros. Invest in companies like Bay.com, Get Your Guide, Unity. Uh, and of course, um, the reason I'm here interviewing Timo is we were proud investors in small giant games as well, uh, which as was mentioned, was bought by Zynga for a billion dollars about 18 months ago or so. Uh, and Timo, um, on behalf of everyone, thank you very much for joining us today. So I believe we have seven minutes. I have five questions for you, so we'll have to race through this. Um, First question for you. So I know as an investor in Small Giant, the first game that the company launched unfortunately didn't work out. The second game unfortunately didn't work out. 
What gave you and the team the confidence that Empires and Puzzles, your third game, would work out? What did you learn from the first two games that you could apply to that next shot at it? Yeah, great question. So, uh, uh, first of all, I would say that, um, uh, I mean, we learned our lessons uh, throughout the journey. So, first game, we spent too much time on it. We were not fast enough to, to, to build it. And we were focusing on, let's say, not the real metrics of the game. We were focused on a little bit of like vanity stuff, like pixel perfect graphics and things like that. Whereas uh, we should have been more focused on on the actual uh, content depth of the game, you know, that, you know, and how, how does the actual user retention work? So in short, we were not enough data oriented. We trusted more our opinions than data. Um, and, and, uh, but I suppose, you know, it was a very painful learning experience when you spend almost two years of your time with your darling and then your darling turns out to be not your darling. Uh, but, but we were, we had the guts enough to actually kill the project very quickly and take all of the learnings that we could possibly get. And, you know, and, and the key thing was really to, to be, go into the data-driven iterative development and, uh, and throw away your opinions. Yep. No, it's true. And, and from the investor side, we always say you don't invest into a game, you invest into a team who builds games. And that was definitely the case when, uh, with, with small giant games um, as well. Um, so as we mentioned, Empires of Puzzles launched. It did amazingly well from the very, very beginning, which is a testament to the, the team and the product. Um, and yet three years later, Empires of Puzzles is still doing very well. It's still near the top of the charts from a top grossing perspective. So what, what has driven the longevity of, of that game? Yeah, first of all, I think, you know, we, we did a lot of homework uh, back in the day. So we, we found a sort of market niche that, that was really, we thought at that time, that would be sustainable for a long time. And that turned out to be right. So we, we really didn't, again, trust our opinions. We, we went to the, you know, we did a desk of research on, on the market opportunity. We dissected about 50 top games from the, down to the progressive mathematics. So we understood, you know, what works in the games and what doesn't work. And we sort of incorporated a lot of those systems and, and sort of, uh, and, and sort of, uh, you know, bake that with a, with a nice sort of a um, um, uh, concept that, you know, has, has sort of, you know, uh, lasted a long time. Uh, so the original sort of positioning was correct. Uh, but, but then after that, it's, re it's really been sort of uh, listening to our players, you know, very carefully. We have, you know, you know, every single feature that we do is tested with beta testers with our community before we launch them. Uh, but it's really about the content and feature cadence so that, you know, we have one of the best life ops operations in the world in terms of how we keep the game refreshed uh, and and we just it just never ends it gets bigger and bigger uh, so that we cater for the for the elder players so they always have more things to do go deeper into the game and of course the newcomers who come to the game they they have a vast vast sort of environment and and game to explore yeah. Now, that sounds daunting, and it sounds like you would have a lot of people uh, needed at Small Giant to be able to deliver that. But actually, I know, at least in the early days, that wasn't very true. It was an insanely small team, even up till the stage of, of exit. Maybe you can tell us how you maintain that hyper growth with an incredibly lean team. I think you were under 30 people when the business was bought. Is that right? No, no, that was much less. So, you know, you know what is quite remarkable about this, because, you know, the name Small Giant sort of, uh, you know, we have to be small because otherwise we couldn't be Small Giant, right? So so we had to keep, <laughs> you know, so this, this very big game was built literally by 12 people. Small teams are just much more efficient. Um, and when, when you couple that with the very rigorous decision making, because, you know, if you're a small team, you can only do a few things. And luckily, those few things were exactly the right things to do. And the combination of decision making and good individuals uh, uh, was the trick. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. So, so 12 people and sold for uh, a t t right around a billion dollars. I think you're right. That has to be a record uh, in, in any industry. So it's amazing. Now, well, at the time we sold, we were 34, I think. OK, that's right. You, had, you had added. Company. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not that big in the grand scheme of things. Uh, and, and clearly Zynga made a very attractive offer um, for the business, uh, but, but what convinced you to actually sell versus staying independent? Because there was definitely a path to continuing to remain independent and drive the business forward. Yeah, that's a great question. So we, we were in a fortunate position that we, we a, lot, a lot of the you know big boys you know started knocking our knocking our door and we we could choose so um, and we did have our conversations about that should we uh, uh, stay independent but of course you know uh, you know games business is it's a fickle business and we one of one of the concerns was that you know that we had a very significant offer on the table. 
But we figured, you know, there were like four things really. Uh, first of all, we wanted to make sure that we find, if we find a buyer who would really guarantee that we could maintain our unique culture and way of working, staying small, if, if you like. And Zynga's model was really a collection of, you know, independent nation states, if you like, you know, studios that can can operate on their own. Um, so that that was that was a that was a match. The second thing is that we we knew from our mathematics for our data models that this game will. We were only at the beginning. We were in the bulk of two hundred million dollar revenue. We we're very profitable at that time. We knew that over the next few years we're going to make a lot of profit. And we said if we can find a model that yes, yes, we can you know get a decent amount of money right now, but we can also have an uncapped, unlimited earnout model that would you know basically allow us to share the results with the with the new parent. And that fitted you know Zinga's thought you know Zinga's thinking perfectly. And there was another take. So. The model was, you know, we, we continued to be as entrepreneurs with a little bit of money in the bank whilst still having a big opportunity to, to you know, get the really big money later on. So that was really important because we did have some uh, big cultural clashes with some of the other buyers, very alien culture and sort of ways of working. We wanted to work with nice professional people who share the same vision and same ways of working and, and just love mobile games. And uh, it was like four, four sort of ticks in the box and, you know, there you go. Here we go. Match made in heaven. Thank you. That was absolutely brilliant. Tick, 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 tick. Don't be afraid to kill your darlings. Choose your moment and pivot to agile, data-driven development. Absolutely sage advice there. And uh, congratulations to all involved. That was great. So um, that was a fascinating, inspiring success story. And do we want to find out who the small giant games of the future are? Yes, we sure do. So we're going to kick off the South Summit 100 startup competition in the category of gaming within consumer trends, and we're going to hear from three hopefuls. Now, as you might know from the previous days of two exciting uh, days of battles, each startup has three minutes to pitch to our amazing jury, who will then make notes and ask a maximum of two probing questions that each can take no longer than 30 seconds, and we will be keeping that clock very tight. The five criteria that are being used by the judges uh, to evaluate the startups are Innovation, scalability, team, viability, and investability. And are you excited already? Because I certainly am. Because we have a special jury, including Sean there, gathered from all over the world, joining us virtually and joining us at La Nave here in Madrid. So I thought I'd pop over and just say hello to um, our wonderful socially distanced judges who are looking fabulous. And thank you so much for joining us. Um, so I am welcoming to the stage from Sabadell, Marion Bauer, lovely to see you here. And from Plug and Play Tech Center, Lucia Latore, lovely, lovely to meet you, great. And last but by no means least, we also have from Weira, a fabulous, fabulous company, Paloma Castellano. Thank you all so much for joining us here in La Nave. Uh, it makes a great difference to have people here in person. You get a different vibe, but I think it's wonderful that South Summit is bringing together the physical and the digital. And speaking of which, we're going to go over to our wall here of virtual judges. And um, I believe we might have a representative from a, quite a small startup you may have heard of called Google. And uh, we're delighted to welcome, to welcome Jorge Nogales. Jorge, where, there, there you are, top right hand corner, lovely to see you. And welcome everybody, nice to see you. I won't name everybody because we're going to keep it tight on time, but I look forward to your questions. So we're going to go to block one of our fabulous startup competition, uh, and we're going to hear from some fantastic gaming companies. But as many of you will be aware, um, you know, the market crisis caused by COVID-19 has really had a devastating effect on many industries. And, but gaming has really soared as more people have gone into lockdown and they've been researching how to have some quality entertainment that is not only fun, but also completely interactive and also competitive. So gaming has absolutely soared during the pandemic. Actually, according to a global gaming study on the impacts of COVID-19 by Simon Kusher and partners and Dynata, there has been a 30% growth in players who spend more than five hours a week playing video games. And the good news is they are spending more money. In fact, there has been a 39% increase uh, growth in monthly spending and 60% of players are playing new games and trying new formats like multiplayer. So 
as we saw there with Timo, it's really tick, 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 all, tick, 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 tick. All of the indicators are going in the right direction. So there's a real world of opportunity here for the right idea in gaming. And we are going to meet some of them today. And I would like to welcome to the stage our first startup of the day to make their pitch in three minutes and not a second longer. They are Cloudware from Spain, a cloud gaming platform that allows the user to play any game purchased um, on any from a digital video game retailer, and they're able to play their game on any device. Absolutely brilliant. And here to claim his three minutes in front of our esteemed panel of judges is their CEO, Daniel Olmedo Nieto. Daniel, your time starts now. Hi, South Summit. Thank you so much for the opportunity. My name is Daniel. I'm Cloudware's CEO, and I'm going to talk about the great gaming platform that we are building that will give you the possibility to get rid of all this machinery that you would probably have if you're a gamer. So if you just want to focus on gaming, forget about the hardware, then Anywhere is your gaming platform. Anywhere is a cloud gaming platform that allows you to play all your video games in all your devices. What we do is we execute the video game in the cloud and we send real-time streaming to your device so you're able to play. The only thing that you have to do is to link your video game store account with Enware and you're good to go. All the library that you have of video games will be automatically populated in Enware's account. So if you think of it this way, um, Enware is a service that gives you the possibility to bring the gaming experience wherever you go in a very simple way. The platform right now is in a better state in which users can subscribe for $4.99 per month. And one interesting information about the gaming industry is that one third of the planet plays video games. So we want to be that new consumption model that other platforms have done in other industries. Uh, we believe that the biggest market to tackle and the most interested, that the ones that have showed more interest in, in the cloud gaming services like us are the casual gamers. And we also know that this field is getting more and more crowded by other players, like for example, Stadia. We know that uh, and in differentiation of these players, we have two main differentiators. The, the first one of it is that we are able to give you uh, more than 10,000 video games that you can bring to the platform. So you will be able to have more than 10,000 different experiences inside anywhere. And we also have a new algorithm that solves, uh, let's say, the two main problems in the cloud gaming field, which is the latency and the stability of the streaming when you have a bad internet connection. These are some of the numbers of the platform. We have 10,000 users uh, registered in the platform, and 55% of them are between 18 and 26 years old. And this is the team behind uh, the scenes of the platform. And this is my contact information. So if you want to know more about Anywhere, please visit playanywhere.com. And if you want to know or if you want to be involved in some way on the story of how the gaming industry changed, let's talk. Thank you. Fantastic. With 13 seconds left to spare, that was a tight presentation. OK, so we're going to stroll over here to our wall of judges from all over the world. Do you have any questions from Daniel about that fantastic service? Do we have any questions from Lenave? <coughs> if you have a question, just put up your hand. Uh, do you think this is an exciting area? A third of the population of the planet are playing video games. Do you have a question about this? If you put up your hand. OK, and we're going to go to Hans Muntekas from IE University. So Hans, if you will come and join me over here, we will dial in Daniel or Daniel. Uh, and yeah. uh, yes, OK. So and oh, then you can you. ask your question directly. Thank you for a very nice presentation. Uh, my question to you in, in 30 seconds. I saw, the, I saw your slide with, uh, with Netflix and Spotify. Uh, and they all have competitors on their way to, to achieving uh, their user mass. So my question to you is, who is your competitors? And uh, how do you distinguish uh, compared to those? Fabulous. Uh, well, uh, thank you. Thank you for the, the question. Um, uh, what I can say is that we have those two key differentiators that I mentioned in, in the presentation, which is we are the ones that are able to uh, by the most catalog available. Uh, we, we have the possibility to synchronize with all the games that you already have. 
and we believe that this uh, gaming sector is going to be very uh, a very fragmented market. So, for example, Netflix has a lot of competitors, but it's not the only company that is offering that service. You have also Amazon Prime, you have also HBO. So we believe that we're going to be one of those. And I'm afraid that's it. We do have to keep the time very tight. Thank you very much, yeah. Daniel. And thank you for that brilliant question. OK, well, I'm going to wave at our judges over there in the virtual, in the physical world of La Nave and in our virtual world here. We have time for one more question. Uh, which will take 30 seconds and not a second more, as you can see. Um, any more questions? We're, we're kind of addressing this whole move from uh, ownership to access with Netflix and um, Netflix and um, ah over there. Okay, wonderful. So we have Paloma from Waira. Uh, okay, we're moving from ownership to access. We're using Netflix. We're using Spotify. What does this mean for the world of gaming? And what brilliant question do you have for our friend Daniel? Uh, first of all, thank you for, for the presentation and the amazing pitch. Uh, just a question, how are you acquiring users? Great question, user acquisition. What say you, Daniel? Yeah, um, well, uh, we uh, did some experiments in the past, uh, in-house experiments, and tried to gather users from all the research that we've done uh, and the most interested uh, segmentation of, of the population that we have in the, in the service. But most of the growth that we've had, 50% uh, of the growth that we've had, has been during the pandemic. Uh, so as we've mentioned in, in this uh, presentation, um, uh, the, the gaming industry is growing even more now. And most of the, the more than 10,000 users that we've uh, gathered during this time, most of them uh, has been organically, pu purely organically. Fantastic. Okay, that was brilliant, brilliant presentation. Very quick and great questions and good answers there. So we are going to now explore this area of gaming. It's so, so hot. And we're actually going to welcome two um, wonderful people to join us here in La Nave, uh, who are going to discuss this with another guest who is joining us virtually. So first of all, I'll welcome our real world guests who are Sergio Gonzalez Sanz from Simple Cloud and hola and Mariano Martinez, who is a Director of Partnerships at Telefonica. Welcome both. Thank you. Bienvenidos. And we are going to welcome a virtual guest, who is Alberto Martinez Guerrero from Streamlutes. OK, nice to nice see to you. See Hello you. and welcome. Hey, Alberto. Um, so uh, because you're joining us virtually, I'm going to start with you, if that's OK. Gaming, as we've For seen, sure. is a really big deal in 2020. The sector is already bigger than music and movies combined. And many predict that eSports is going to be the biggest format in entertainment. How do you, would you recommend that people can make a living from their passion? Mm. Well, there are a few different ways to make a living from video games. But the important thing is it's not about playing video games. It's about creating entertainment. So you can do this in two different ways. The first one is creating competition around the games. And the second one, the second one is creating fun and interesting content around the game that people is like looking forward to, to consume. The first one is really similar to traditional sports. Like there's a lot of people uh, playing football, for example. In fact, I can go out and, and play football, but I'm not gonna make a living because I go going out and, and play football. So uh, you need to be the best, the best one, or at least one of the best um, to make a living from it. Because at the end, when you are the best, teams hire you to play for them. And they have money to pay you because actually they have an audience. They have like uh, a lot of people that enjoy and are entertained by uh, that competition that you are creating. So in, in eSports, it works exactly the same. If you are going to make a living from competition, uh, you are going to be, you need to be one of the top uh, top players in the world, and teams are going to pay you to entertain the, the audience. There are two big big differences, which is basically that on eSports, uh, there's a private company owning the game, and also that is, it does not require like physical uh, abilities, right? And the other part, like, hey, how can you make money uh, money with eSport if you are not a top player? Well, at the end, it's all about what we mentioned uh, before. It's about creating entertainment. So there's a lot of people creating engaging content while playing video games, even if they are not the best player because they are fun, because they are smart, because they have charisma. So they are basically competing with Netflix or with television or even with uh, YouTube uh, or any social, social media. Um, viewers have like at the end viewers have a limited amount of time to consume content so these gamers or creators are competing with all of those platforms to that give content to to viewers real quick how does stream loots fit into this picture that you've just painted 
Well, at the end, I, I mentioned before that like creators have become like a new way of entertainment and they are competing with Netflix or television. But in order to do that, they need to make a living from it. And this is exactly what we do. They, they gather big and super engaged audiences from like TikTok or Instagram or Twitter or Twitch. And we, once they gather that audience, we help them monetize that audience. Basically, what we are trying to do is like we are driving a shifting work from traditional like employment arrangements to self-employment that allows greater autonomy and monetization of like uniqueness and creativity of scales. Basically, uh, we are trying to give creators the opportunity to directly communicate with their audience and add value directly to their audience by allowing their fans to purchase real-time real -time interaction with them. The fans can purchase things like I play a game with you or like I make you play blindfold for two minutes, I send you a dedicated video, everything is possible. At the end, the fans are looking forward to pay for some second of attention of the influencer and we give the influencer the tools to allocate that attention properly. Fascinating. Thank you so much, Alberto. That was brilliant. Okay. How interesting. So we're going to come to yourself next, um, Sergio. Now, we're looking at remote working. It's the new normal, um, but this is something that's gone on in the content creation industries with round-the-clock production for a while. Um, you know, there's issues to take into account, like content security, proprietary code. How is this helping bring us into a new world where people are working remotely? And, and what's, what do you want to share about that world? Well, I think COVID has changed completely how we work and how we live. Uh, and even when this all passes, that will, will, will happen. Yes. Uh, I think nobody will see the world in the same way because mm -hmm. even, you know, for, for an environmental perspective, uh, air is cleaner right now, right? Because yeah, yeah. there are less cars. So I think from a society perspective, there is a need for telework and <coughs> a need to find new ways of working. When, we, when it comes to, to content creation and especially video games, people tend to think that playing the game is the same as creating the game. Uh, uh, it's, it's not the same at all. I mean, one thing is, I mean, creating a game is, is, is like a big production. It takes lots of people. It takes lots, lots of time. And also, uh, it's, it's very variant. I mean, there's a there's lot of changes while you are actually creating games. Mm. Um, and, and, and adapting your investment, your requirements, let's say, easily into that uh, production, uh, it's, it's really a threat. It's, it's really a trend. I mean, yeah. it's something that is, is difficult to, to, to achieve. Yes. So I think platforms, the cloud is the solution for this. I mean, clearly the cloud is, is the solution for this. But how you use the cloud and how you are accessing the cloud is something that is, uh, is the difference between, between you know, sac be, being successful in the cloud and being successful in this new in way of working or not. Yeah. So, and well, have you seen demand for your cloud-based solutions uh, accelerate during the pandemic? Definitely. Okay. I mean, it has grown a lot. I mean, we we not we focus not only in video games, also in media and entertainment, and also in architecture, engineering, education. Yeah. But at the end, it's about using the technology for creating the content with known applications. So don't don't reinvent the wheel. It's mm -hmm. like if you are if you have people with talent creating content in in in, in market, um, let's say wide applications. Uh, the, 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 what, I mean, what the cloud should look for is to provide a proper way to use those applications so the users can actually just extend what they know uh, easily. Thank you. That's absolutely fascinating. Um, so uh, we're going to move to yourself, uh, Mariano. Now, uh, as I like to call it, the world has really evolved to a species of phono sapien where everyone is doing everything on their mobile device. So obviously, you've got a really unique view on this whole world of consumer trends because everyone has a mobile phone. How do you see consumer trends in gaming mm -hmm. from the viewpoint of a telecommunications company? Okay, uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, definitely, um, mobile gaming um, has been an incredible phenomenon. So Fortnite, or PUBGN, or Garena, Free Fire. So that's the, um, for me. We will see a lot of evolution in mobile. For me, uh, for us, mainly the key or more important um, change is going to be in the cloud gaming. Mm -hmm. Cloud gaming it's, uh, it will represent a total new model for consumers. It will be the same transformation that we saw in the music or in the video streaming. It's going to happen in uh, it's going to happen in, in the video gaming industry. So um, for for telecommunications company, cloud gaming is probably the main use case for new technologies connectivity in terms of connectivity, 5G or edge computing are going to benefit of this uh, of this um, of this uh, uh, connectivity. So um, we are trying to not just 
offering the best gaming experience in terms of connectivity, but also offer to the consumers that, for instance, when they are home, they can prioritize the traffic to gaming um, so they can have a a better experience, or maybe very simple, they can open the, open the ports in the router for gaming. So that's, that's something that uh, will happen um, now. So yeah. that's, that's a very important transformation for consumer adoption. Fantastic. So the future is going to be anything but boring. My goodness, we're in for some exciting times. Thank you so much um, to Mariano, Sergio, and Thank Alberto for joining us virtually. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Brilliant. So um, I, I love podcasts. I present a couple of podcasts myself, and um, I listen to one by an Irishman, a fellow Irishman called David McWilliams, and he has some great guests on with him. And uh, his guest on his most um, uh, on an episode a little while ago uh, was talking about growth after the pandemic, and she said it was going to be exponential. So it's not that things are going to be massively, you know, bad or just the same. It's going to be exponential growth for certain sectors. And I think gaming is absolutely one of them. Um, so we, with that in mind, we are actually going to welcome startup number two, who's going to pitch to our fantastic panel of judges. And startup two is Dixper from Spain. They are bringing real interactiveness to the live game streaming market by providing streamers and viewers with disruptive interaction and monetization tools. So folks, we welcome to the stage the CEO and co-founder of Dixper, Ivan Mayo. Your three minutes exactly starts now. Hello, my name is Ivan Mayo. I am CEO and co-founder of Dixper, where we are making live game streaming interactive. Let me tell you that live game streaming is today a big, big trend amongst global gaming industry, and successful live streamers have become worldwide celebrities. Today, more than 6 million gamers are sharing their gameplays to almost 1 billion people yearly, which is a huge entertainment industry. If this industry has two problems. The first problem is the experience itself, because you can do today the same you could 10 years ago, which is just watching and chatting. So the experience here is ready for uh, disruption. And the second problem is monetization itself, because it's easy for big streamers to monetize their audience, but not that easy for uh, smaller long tail streamers to do the same. So they, it's starting for them to find new products to monetize because they are killer sellers if they have a killer product. And this is what we are providing them at Dixper. We have developed a unique disruptive technology that enables those viewers to uh, interact with the stream and with the game itself where magic happens those enabling them to make actions that could not be done before. And by using this technology, we have uh, created our real-time in-game interactions marketplace for those streamers to monetize their audience. They sell these uh, kind of interactions. We like to call these interactions skills, and these skills can perform things like this. Viewers can make the cursor of the game huge. They can freeze the character of the game. They can flip or rotate the screen while the streamer is playing. Or for example, they can send blood to the screen, making the stream much more fun. In regarding the market, this is a fast growing market, really resilient to coronavirus situations, for example. And we are also surfing a big, a global trend where biggest technology players are pushing it hard and we are not competitors to any of them. Uh, the way we go to market is really simple. We partner with key streamers. We know Dixper is vital by use because these streamers do all we have more other streamers in the viewership. So we are hitting our viral loop this way. The way we make money is easy. Uh, we take a commission from each transaction. So we make money when streamers do. And I want to show you our trip to now, which uh, has been really successful. We released our MVP in January and are, we are beating hardly our aggressive forecast. We are a team of eight people, uh, three co-founders. I was a core technology developer for PlayGiga, which was acquired by Facebook last year. And Alex and Luis are also co-founders and really experts on the gaming industry. As you can see, our mission is bringing interactiveness to the live streaming market and bringing back, uh, breaking barriers between live streaming and gaming. If you want to learn more, I will be happy to chat. Thanks. Fabulous. Again, coming in ahead of time, I'm very impressed. Uh, just think about the amount of work that goes into making those presentations exactly three minutes or less. Do we have a question from our panels? OK, yes, we do. We have a question. Thank you so much. So um, take it away. Quick question uh, around the platforms where you guys, where your solution works. 
does it work does it work across different platforms or are you guys focused on on just one platforms meaning twitch or facebook youtube etc and and what is the risk if there is any uh, that such platforms may prevent your your technology from from working thank you Hi Diego, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, regarding the, the, the platforms we work with, we are starting with Twitch because it's the main platform in this area and we will be integrating with uh, all the rest of the platforms. This is not a problem of the technology. We can integrate with any. We are uh, technology agnostic, or agnostic in, this, uh, in this area. And regarding the risk of, of them uh, trying to do so, um, I think it's not... Uh, something that, that they will be looking to. At uh, the moment, they are trying to build interactive games, but not a platform that uh, makes interactions between the, between the streamer and the game itself. Wonderful, and exactly in 30 seconds. Thank you, Diego, and thank you for that great answer. Do we have any more questions? Again, put your hands up. I see a hand raised over there in the nave. Do we have any hands over here? We have our amazing production team behind the scenes who are streamlining the process and lining up and lining up the next uh, question, which will be coming from Lucia Latore from the Plug and Play Center, who is joining us here in person. So thank you so much, Lucia. Your 30 seconds with Ivan starts now. Good morning, Ivan. Thank you very much for your presentation. I was wondering, you mentioned there's a target market of 1 billion users. Uh, what is your forecast for next year of users, uh, streamers, and viewers? Um, Regarding uh, the forecast, uh, we are even uh, changing it because we are strongly, I said in the presentation, hardly beating, I meant strongly beating our forecast. And I cannot give concrete numbers because, because it is uh, being kind of uh, a madness at the moment. Uh, what I can say is we are growing between 50% to 100% each month. And uh, we are uh, we expect the, the next uh, 12 months to be really, really uh, huge exponential growth for our platform. All our growth is coming organically, I must say. OK, we gave you a few extra seconds there because that was a great visit. Thank you so much, and thank you for the question here in Nanave. And at our South Summit stage here in Nanave, we're delighted to be joined by two gentlemen, Nacho Muta from Endesa and uh, Xavier Fite from Ride Hive. So apologies if I haven't pronounced anybody's name right. My name is pretty difficult. It's an old Irish name, and I'm learning Spanish and Catalan names. So um, wonderful to be here. Thank you so much. Now, the conversation will be moderated by Ander. He is the co-founder of TicketBiz, a company acquired by eBay in 2016. And he's also an investor in Chiquisimo, Fintonic, Ontruck, and Luciero. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are bringing together the physical and the virtual worlds here at South Summit 100. It is such a thrill to be here. And uh, I'm going to hand over to you now, Ander, uh, to moderate our next panel. Thank you, Ander. I'm very happy to make an introduction to uh, for Oyer, our first panelist. Uh, he leads a company, uh, he founded a company called Loquero, with an online personal service for, for women. The company has raised over 30 million euros, and I can say we're a proud investor through the fund that I, uh, that I manage, All Iron Ventures. So welcome, Oyer. Thanks, Ander. How are you? Good, good. Um, Oyer, tell us a little bit more about uh, Loquero and its evolution so far. So yes, as you were saying, Loquero is an online personal software service for, for women. No? So how it works is like based on the our client's uh, style profile, um, uh, a personal shopper will choose five clothing items for them uh, that we will ship to their to their home. Um, the clients will have five days to decide what they keep and, and return the rest. So um, this this model has uh, so much uh, discovery component. Uh, like the clients don't know what they are getting until they get the, the box home. So we, we help them discover new brands, new new possibilities that they, they wouldn't have like, uh, chosen by, by themselves. No? So we launched in, in 2016, and we are now present in, in seven countries, um, and the team is uh, nearly 400 people. So regarding the evolution, uh, we've been in, in some growth path for, for these years. No? This year has been um, a, little, a little strange, 
but uh, like after the lockdown was was over, we we managed to to have our our best uh, top line month and. And we are back on track uh, on, on the growth path, like uh, with also a good September and, and looking forward to an exciting Q4. I was saying that very, uh, that very, uh, the success is great. And now you guys are just launching your TV campaign. So uh, we're looking forward to see the, the results mm -hmm. on that. Uh, one of the key component of uh, Loquero is actually his personalization. You're able to personalize it, its box that is sent to the, to the customers. So uh, how do you do it and what would you consider is your Locato secret sauce to do it? Yeah, so, so personalization, as you were saying, is, is the core of what we do. You know? like, um, the, um, we, we, we like to say that we offer the most personalized experience in the fashion industry. And that's thanks to the data we gather from, from our clients. So we gather so much data from their style profile with their taste, preferences, like budget, etc. But also we gather so much data from the feedback. So uh, with every box, we get a structured feedback of uh, the items we sent them and they tell us what they liked and what uh, they didn't know. So thanks to that, uh, everybody learns. So our algorithms learn and, and get better and better, but also our teams of uh, buyers, the personal shoppers and all the teams learn so we can uh, improve the, the experience. No? So thanks to that, the more our clients repeat and the more personal, personalized service we can we can offer and, and a better experience that, that we offer to, to our clients. No? So the key is in the, in the data, as, as I was saying. Thank you very much, Oyer. Uh, Thanks to you. Uh, Nacho, um, you are the head of the product B2C uh, department for Endesa. And this is a big utility company. Uh, some would argue a very traditional company. Uh, how important is for for you guys the data? Um, uh, is there any kind of personalization that you offer on your services? Data, as, as you can imagine, uh, Endesa, with more than um, 11 million clients, uh, uh, handle a very big uh, volume of data, and uh, we use uh, this data to 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 uh, give the clients different different products, different services, uh, always uh, through the personalization. So mm, the last, the latest uh, uh, product that we have launched is uh, is uh, a product uh, Unica. It's, it's the it's the call it unique Unica is the name, and uh, Unica it's uh, really a, a, a like a subscription model, no. And you know, in a subscription model, one of the main uh, things that you can find there is the personalization. So uh, data uh, is, is the, the, the key to, to reach the, this, this kind of products. Um, we, how do we do this kind of products? How do we uh, uh, build this kind of products? Uh, OK, mm, in this case, we have uh, information of the the, 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 the consume of the, the, the customers, and we can uh, build models and to, to uh, know how the clients are going to, to consume the energy, not just uh, actual clients, even the whole market. Um, but it's not just the personalization, the, the key. There are more keys in, in this case. Uh, the simplicity, you know, you have to, to give the, to the clients a, a simple uh, value proposition, easy to understand, easy to contract, like in a subscription model, you know, you have to pay a, 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 a in a monthly basis a fee, a fee in a monthly basis, uh, where you can uh, consume all the energy that you going to need, that you're going to need. So uh, with those uh, things, uh, we build this product, Unica, you know, uh, like a subscription model. It's, it's, uh, here, the, the, the trends of the market uh, are going to the, this kind of services, like, like subscriptions, and we in Endesa, uh, uh, following the, the, the trend, the tendency, uh, think that this is the way of the future of the market, of our sector. Thank you very much, Nacho. Um, Xavier, uh, you, you, I'm, I'm sure you don't, don't like the data at uh, Hive Drive. I mean, uh, electric scooters, hundreds of thousands of points of data. But how do you use that data to personalize the experience, um, uh, the experience of the users? 
Sorry, I think it's very interesting that what, what we are working on, uh, I think that nowadays, as you mentioned on Loquero and you mentioned on Endesa, we have to make a tailor-made offer to the customer, so we have to understand what is the requirements that they are asking for and what we can offer to, to them to, in terms of pricing, in terms of service, in terms of type of vehicles that we offer. So we have to understand, and we're working on that, and how the customer is reacting on different factors, like temperature, like... Uh, raining days, like uh, traffic congestions, how we can react and what we can offer to them to, have, to give, give them more flexibility with a flat rate, as, as you mentioned before. I think that the people is moving to uh, have a budget of mobility, a budget of electricity, a budget for fashion, and I think that we have to offer this flat rate in order to give them as much service as they can, as much flexibility as we can, and, and give and, and and offer the best uh, service as we can. Thank you, Xavier, Nacho. Oh, yeah, a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you all. Thank you, Xavier, Nacho, Oyer, and Ander for moderating. That was an absolutely fascinating conversation there. I love that idea that we're all moving towards uh, always on personalized areas of electricity, of fashion, maybe for me less so, of uh, you know, mobility, scooters, etc. Fantastic. Uh, I, my, I, my favorite startup might include Guinness somewhere in that mix. Uh, so anyway, now we are going to go back to our startup competition, and we have a really exciting one for you now. Um, our final hopeful in the category of gaming is Ego Games, who are going to be represented by their CEO and founder, excuse me, co-founder, Alejandro Saez Novales. So, Alejandro, you get three minutes exactly. I wish you good luck, and then we'll have questions with the jury. Your three minutes starts right now. Good morning, my name is Alejandro Saez. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Ego Games. We've created a technology that brings esports competitions to everyone's favorite mobile games. We're on a mission to massify this industry by bringing those simple titles that everyone has ever played in, the, in terms of them or in, in their mobile device in a way so everyone can become an athlete, an esports athlete, anyone, everywhere, anytime. Let's go now to say what an esport is. If I, if I ask you what an esport is, you probably be thinking about those PC components such as Fortnite that we already know them because of those players that are actually making a lot of money winning those competitions. But we haven't thought about those simple games that actually could expand the niche of the market, that actually could be enthusiastic about esports, and we could amplify the, the number of people that could make a living out of this industry, right? So what does an esport need to be considered like that? There's a skill game that actually has three components that that's exactly what Ego Games provide, the whole infrastructure to become, to, to create or transform any type of skill-based game into an esport. This way, we get rid of those in-app purchases and those advertisements that actually give a bad experience to the player. And in terms of that, we only provide with esports competition, giving a way better remuneration also to the game creator so they can focus on doing what they love that is created the best, the best video games. If I want to state that, we give you a, a brief state of the industry. We can all agree that the mobile device is taking a leading role, increasing in terms of revenue higher than the PC and console combined, and there are already more than 2 billion mobile gamers worldwide. If I want to introduce mobile esports, as all traditional sports do, the player needs to train in order to become pro. And that's why we are competitive and provide free competition as well as real cast competitions. How it works is an SDK plugged into a current game just as a mere bottom or as their unique monetization way. The player would enter, deposit into account, pick a competition mode either for free or real money, pay the entry fee, which is 15 to 20 percent higher than the price pool, and that's the revenue we split with the with the game creator in order to give the player the possibility of, of to win real cash. Other services our SDK provides the streaming part, the social one, and the leaks that actually is really good for retention. And we are giving we are currently giving away more than 100 thousand dollars every month. Our case study with 21 Jack from the developer Friday Moon. They're from Spain. They're making, they grew organically and they're making six times more revenue in Arpdout than Candy Crush. There's also the case of the gamer making more than $3,000. It's pretty good with, with, the, with the game. We provide a whole technology system to ensure esports competitions. Our competitors, we got two main competitors. Our business model, we cover all of their parts, both with simple games, our both with manager, thanks to the partner studios that we already have. We did it thanks to a great team of 17 employees born and raised in Madrid. And are, that makes possible to host more than 100,000 tournaments every day, make players win over 1 million euros with dollars, sorry, with Ego Games. We have more than 40 studios already partnered, 20 games launched, 70 to come. And we are creating a new entire industry empowering the mobile device. And we're not going to stop until our competitions are higher than all traditional sports we know combined. Okay. Thank you very much. 
Fantastic, Alejandro. That was a brilliant pitch. My goodness, he squeezed so much information and went right down to the line there. That's what we like to see. Great stuff. Um, okay, so what did you think of Ego Games? Do you have any questions for Alejandro and this exciting, exciting category of gamifying gaming itself? As before, just raise your hands, our esteemed uh, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I see one hand up there. Are there any hands in the level? There's two hands up here. Okay, I feel like an auctioneer. And, uh, and there's three hands. Okay, so, uh, we, okay, we're going to go to Alexandre. So, Alexandre, if you'd like to join us over here on this virtual screen, you get to ask Alejandro a question uh, within 30 seconds exactly. Hi, Alejandro. Um, I just wanted to know what is the business model of uh, the product? Uh, hello, I, I believe that our business model is to transform mobile legal games into esports. We provide a full SDK that guts all the composition of tournament system, anti fraud, matchmaking, all the all the skill composition combined in order to pro to promote these competitions and give everyone the possibility of winning real money cash. That's the, that's that's basically our business model. We partner with the studio and we give them our SDK in order to provide this this competitive arena experience to all their players increasing retention and increasing engagement of them. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. That was fascinating. A very nice, quick answer within 30 seconds. That's what we'd like to see. Any more questions from the Nave? We have a hand up over there. Do we have any hands up? We have a hand over here. My goodness. There's people competing for for the questions. So, yes, and we'd like to welcome back to the stage Sean, who had that great tap with Timo earlier. Sean, 30 seconds is all yours with Alejandro. Thank you. Uh, Alejandro, a uh, quick question for you. What is the legality from a betting gaming perspective in the key markets for you? Thank you, Sean. Thank you for asking me. It's a pleasure to answer for you. Our legality is the same as all esports, all traditional sports do. What we do, we are skill-based. We, we make sure our competitions are 100% based on skill. There are not any chance involved in our competitions. We have certified our algorithm. We, we, we have made the patent and certified with PricewaterhouseCoopers. Therefore, we can, we can provide esports competition worldwide in all, all countries except 32, that that's what our geolocation services actually detect in order to promote either free or real money competitions worldwide. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the answer. That was absolutely brilliant. My goodness, 30 seconds exactly. Okay, we're just going to quickly move into our next section, which is all about personalization within consumer trends. And the area of personalization is really where you'd expect to find references to folks like uh, Philip K. Dick and the Minority Report. You might have seen that film where Tom Cruise is running through a shopping center and the billboards are chasing after him and saying, hey, Tom Cruise, would you like to buy this? Uh, that technology actually exists in the Westfield Shopping Center in London. Facial recognition cameras, check out your mood, uh, your gender, your age, and then offer you personalized billboards based on that. So which business models are on the right side of privacy, and how can you leverage personalization effectively? Which of these startups from the Startup South Summit 100 competition are going to be innovating their way to success? Let's find out with our first pitcher, uh, who is A.D. Biter, the CEO of Nilus from Argentina, and they offer affordable and healthy food for low-income people. So take it away. AD, your three minutes starts now. Hi, my name is Adi Weitler, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Nihilus. There are over 2 billion people in the world who suffer from food insecurity. This means that they do not have the resources to eat a healthy meal every day. This doesn't have to be this way if we consider that we waste over a third of the food that we produce while the food is perfectly edible for reasons such as aesthetic or packaging defects or because the food is about to expire. On top of this, food waste is a massive source of environmental damage. We emit over 3.3 gigatons of CO2 equivalents into the atmosphere because of the food that ends up being wasted. We also use 30% of the world's arable land and 20% of the world's hydric resources for producing food that ends up in trash cans. This is what we're here for at Nylos. We aim to eradicate hunger by rescuing healthy food at risk of being discarded and distributing it at discounted prices in low income neighborhoods. The main enabler to fulfill our mission is the technology. We have created a cutting edge digital platform that connects food companies with excess products 
with community kitchens in low-income neighborhoods where they can see their offer, order them online, and we then crowdsource the delivery of the food to each of the community kitchens using a crowdsourcing application. We started as an NGO in 2017 and have been rigorously prototyping and changing our model to adapt to market conditions. We realized that the traditional model of an NGO donating the food to soup kitchens that no, does not work in informal economies like those in Latin America because the tax incentives to donate the food are not enough. In addition, we noticed that NGOs use part-time volunteers to perform the job, and we believe we need the best possible talent to tackle such a huge and important problem. And on top of that, we realize that there is an untapped sustainability in the $1 trillion market that the food waste uh, represents. And on top of that, there are, in Latin America alone, we spend over $4 billion every year feeding the poor. That's where we saw an opportunity to become a for-profit company in 2019. Uh, and that's how we pivoted our model and have been growing exponentially, particularly since the COVID pandemic erupted. And we're incredibly proud of being able to be useful at these uh, times of emergency. This success in growing our model has allowed us to work with some of the world's most innovative companies that have either supported us or invested in our model, such as Google, Siemens, Walmart, SAP, Marriott International, the Clinton Foundation, and the Harvard Innovation Labs, among others. We hope to become part of the South Summit community to continue increasing our impact and continue fighting malnutrition. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Adi Baita from Nilas. What a brilliant, brilliant presentation. The area of food waste and food security is so, so important. So, as always, we invite our judges on our lovely cyber wall and at our lovely studio here at La Nave in Madrid to raise their hands if you have a question. Um, okay, we see one hand there. That's wonderful. Okay, we're going to go straight to Maxime. Maxime, if you'd like to come over here and join us and uh, have a chat with Adi. Your 30 seconds starts right now. Hi there, great presentation. I would just like to understand how do you manage the logistics of bringing the food to community kitchens and ensuring that the quality of food remains um, um, edible and good? Hi, Maxine. Thank you for the question. We work with uh, licensed transportation professionals. We crowdsource the delivery from uh, the source of the waste directly to uh, our warehouse where we inspect the merchandise and in the same day we deliver it to the beneficiaries. So it's an end-to-end -end professionalized process that takes place within 24 hours. Great. Great question. Thank you very much, Adi. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, and we have time for one more question. We have two hands over here. Oh my goodness. And do we have any hands over here on our virtual wall? We are going to go over here and we will invite to ask the next question, um, Lucia Latore. So thank you so much for being patient and putting your hand up. I know we're trying to get around to everybody. So uh, it's fine. Lucia, <laughs> if you'd like to uh, chat with Adi, your 30 seconds now. Thank Hello, Adi. I wanted to know where are you present? Because in the end, this is not like a software company. It's more like a physical thing. So where are you present and what is your international expansion for the next years? We are currently operating in Argentina, in Mexico City, and in Puerto Rico, and we're hoping to expand in Central America, particularly Guatemala and Honduras, and by 2022, um, expand to Brazil. Coming in at 15 seconds, that might be a new record. Absolutely brilliant. So now we're going to hear from another one of our amazing pitchers. And uh, this is the chance to hear from Giuseppe Scionti, who is the CEO and founder of Novameet, who are based in Spain. And Novameet is developing the technology to produce plant-based meats, of which I'm a big fan, uh, alternatives with realistic appearance, taste, and texture of whole animal cuts. Uh, I think this is great. Check it out. So Giuseppe Shianti, CEO of Nova Meat, your, your three minutes, excuse me, starts right now. Hi, I'm Giuseppe Shianti, founder and CEO at Nova Meat, where we develop the next generation of plant-based meat. The current intensive livestock system is neither healthy nor efficient nor sustainable for the environment. With the growing population and the increasing protein consumption rate, by 2050, it just won't be possible to feed everyone keeping the current food system. The awareness on this subject is felt everywhere in Europe, US, 
or Asia, and a large part of the population is cutting or reducing meat consumption. And the acceleration of the plant-based meat sales worldwide is impressive. This market has been growing much faster than the overall food sales, even during the current COVID crisis. The most recent studies point to annual growth higher than 25%. Hinting that the sector will become soon up to 30% of the total global $1 trillion meat market. Our purpose is to accelerate the sector's growth by providing the technology that will bring to market the next generation of products. As it is uh, it's getting clear that the industry is moving beyond the burger, and not only we are developing the next generation of whole muscle cats made from plants. Our technology has already allowed us to create what was credited as the most realistic plant based beef stick and pork fibers meat globally. They are manufactured through our patented microextrusion process, which biomimics the composition of animal muscles, both at the macro and the micro level, simultaneously exhibiting their unique texture, taste, and appearance. Our technology works with natural ingredients to produce an healthier meat with low fat and high protein content, without alternative problems associated with meat consumption. Before we scale up with bigger equipment, we plan to enter the food service segment in the beginning of 2021, providing selected restaurants with technology to prepare plant-based meat products. And for the longer term, we are evaluating our go-to-market strategy to retail, and we are already developing technologies to diversify our revenue sources and commercialize in other verticals, such as in the pet food industry, where we are working on a project with Nestle Purina, and in the booming cell-based meat sector, as we are already providing scaffolds for this vertical. All of this thanks to a diverse, multidisciplinary team with strong scientific knowledge and committed partners. We are raising 6 million euros to fuel our growth up until the end of 2023. We aim to invest in technology such as big extrusion machines and IP development and to expand our team. You can connect with us at monomy.com or send me an email personally at gs at monomy.com. Thank you very much for your attention. Giuseppe, thank you so much. That was absolutely delicious. Uh, I'm all over it. I'm going to find that restaurant in Barcelona and try one of these great Nova Meat steaks as soon as I humanly can. Uh, okay, this is a huge growth area. Do we have any questions for Giuseppe at Nova Meat? As always, just raise your hands. Uh, our virtual panel over here, raise your hands in La Nave. We have a hand over there. Okay, we're going to go straight over to Marion, who is uh, joining us here. Uh, with the question, so thank you so much. Uh, I myself am a vegetarian and I'm a big fan of uh, meat substitutes and uh, my mouth was watering looking at it. So, uh, Marianne, what question do you have for Giuseppe? Thank you, Giuseppe. Um, what is your distribution model and, and your marketing plans to get to the final consumer? Thank you for your question. So our distribution model is, uh, we said that the first uh, year we are focusing on uh, the food service to collaborate with the top restaurants so to associate our products with very high premium uh, level of quality. And then we are uh, collaborating with the uh, big manufacturers, so we provide them certain parts of the machinery together with the licensing model, which is the base of our, of our revenue through our licensing fee. So we do that internationally with the big manufacturers and the machinery providers. Oh, nicely done. Okay, you see, he, he sped up his answer there uh, just to, to get it in 30 seconds. Thank you so much, Giuseppe. Absolutely brilliant. I will be at that restaurant. Um, Marianne, while I'm here, um, I mean, you've obviously got a really interesting view on the world, you know, working where you do, and you have a lot of customer data. And so I'm just curious, um, you know, do you use uh, data for personalization in terms of marketing? H how can you see personalization shaping your strategy there? Yeah, we do indeed. Um, we are a data-driven company, and I think that the, the, the strange thing is that personalization can get creepy uh, when you use it on a wrong way. So now we, we're, of course, we're very interested in, in getting more data and use it on a smart way, but we are also very uh, focused on understanding what is the, cons the consumer uh, behavior and uh, what, is, uh, what are they BS and where are the frictions, and why ha can he really take action on things. So um, we try to study it in a psychological way, uh, what are uh, the key factors, uh, when he's going to take the decision, and mix that with the data. Uh, try to build the content in order to make the, um, the experience the more frictionless and the more natural to the client, because each, each experience is, is very personal to each person. So. Um, I think that being, being clever about what is the behavior 
uh, and what is the, p the people accessing that experience is super important, more, more than data. Absolutely. Yeah, well said. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, just to land a question on you there. That was really interesting, Marianne. Cheers. Thank you. Um, that's such an interesting thought. It's like personalization is such a growth area. And, uh, you know, exactly as you said, there's a bit of a thin line between cool and creepy. And I think where that line lands is in the amount of value it gives to consumers. So uh, you're saying there you're using all the data to really give value and, and kind of provide this VIP service. Um, I think it's an absolute winner. Um, okay, we're going to go back to the pitch competitions and we're going to move swiftly on with. Um, uh, a gentleman called Darren Glenister, who is the CEO of Material Exchange from a country very dear to my heart, which is Sweden. And Material Exchange is a platform that connects the world's largest fashion brands with their material suppliers. And the pandemic has really helped them to power interactions between more brands than ever. 100 brands, 400 suppliers, and 3,000 500 kinds of material. So this is going to be a really interesting pitch. Um, come in, Darren Glenister from Sweden. Your three minutes starts now. My name is Darren Glenister, and I'm CEO of Material Exchange. The problem we're solving is digitizing the relationship between brands and material suppliers. These materials are typically the materials that we use to produce finished footwear and apparel items. Fashion has been trying for a long time to clean itself up. It's trying to become more transparent and brands are trying to get more direct relationships with their material suppliers. Material Exchange is a single digital platform that connects brands with material suppliers and actually has the material suppliers information in a digital form. This means that information is available immediately to brands across the globe. Our platform has two sides. The first is brands, the brands who search the system for materials. And then we have the material suppliers who actually manage their own material data and upload digital representations of their materials. This means that the platform itself is the connecting point, and it means that brands can choose their materials as well as their suppliers through our platform. We have three very positive outcomes from our system. The first is that we have digital material data in one central location, and this could be used for digital product creation, which is now becoming more in demand to reduce the need for physical samples. Also, Supply chains can be adjusted, and we've seen the geopolitical situation has, has pushed that as well as COVID. And then lastly, we have transparency. By having the information in one place, brands can make better choices over the materials they choose. We work with some of the leading industry partners to deliver the solution, including the FDRA, which is the most influential football organization in the world. We also work with leading technology companies to provide our solution. We have a large target audience. We've set a goal of targeting 800 of the biggest supply, uh, brands in the world, as well as 45,000 of the biggest suppliers. We have a few competitors in the space which are indirect. The first is called Lian Fung, which is a sourcing company. The second is a PLM company called Bamboo Rose. And the third is Swatchbook, which is a 3D visualization company. We now have achieved success with over 30 brand groups and work with over 100 individual brands, have over 350 suppliers and 33,000 materials. Our biggest customers include Walmart and actually even Camper from Spain. We've seen a massive increase in the number of brands wishing to get engaged digitally in our platform during COVID. We have more brands during March to July than we did in the whole of 2019. We've also seen a massive increase in the number of suppliers and we have some of the biggest suppliers in the world. And of course, we've got a lot of materials and we've now partnered with some of the biggest digital um, shows uh, for footwear and apparel. Our team comes from within the industry. I previously built a company um, where I started working with Adidas and then eventually sold it to one of the biggest PLM companies in Boston called PTC. Also, my team have been with me through that journey. We understand about fashion and we understand about fashion tech. We have closed uh, 2 million in funding and we're just about to close another 4 million. And I thank you for listening to Material Exchange. Fantastic, Darren. Thank you very much. Taxamika, as you might say in Sweden. Tusen tak. Um, that was fascinating. Like many of the startups here, they are on a mission to save the world in different ways. If you have a question, please raise your hand on our virtual screens or raise your hand in the nave here if you have a question for material exchange. Okay, we're going to go to uh, Lucia. If you'd like to um, join us over here and you can ask Darren a question. Thank you so much, Lucia. Take it away. Good morning, and thank you for your presentation. I was wondering, could you explain a bit better or in depth the business model of your company, please? Yeah, so we actually have uh, two sides to our business model. One is that we have the brands. We're moving to an enterprise um, model where they pay 
for number of users to use the system. We started off by not charging them to perpetuate the marketplace. Uh, from day one, we started charging the suppliers. They pay us between three and four thousand uh, dollars per year to be in the system. And we're now building a series of services that will add additional value to their materials being on the platform. Thank you. And there is your 30 seconds. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Thank you, Darren, and be best wishes for the business. That's absolutely fantastic. OK, so now we're going to have our final pitcher in this block, which is Diego Chorney, who is the CEO and co-founder of Spain's Shop Advisor, uh, described as the first collaborative community for consumer goods that interconnects consumers, brands, and retailers' needs. So the three minutes clock starts right now for your good self. Diego, take it away. Do you check ratings and reviews before making decisions? 90% of consumers do. Let me share how ShopAdvisor is changing the way we make decisions to buy supermarket products by giving the voice to consumers. Supermarkets are full of new and unfamiliar products, and we don't have clear information to make right choices. We face three uncertainties. Will I like the product? Is it healthy? Can I save money with a better or similar product? ShopAdvisor answers the three questions. It's a kind of trip advisor for the supermarket products. When you scan a product, you will see the reviews of people similar to your profile, the nutrition facts and allergens with alerts, and recommendations based on your profile and targeted discount coupons to save money. On top, consumers can try millions of products for free in exchange for giving their opinion on everything they consume. That's how we generate millions of reviews and consumer reports, blending online and offline data. Our business is based in data and it's scalable. We own a community that provides different services that we monetize with retailers and brands. We started charging a fee for consumer reports and generating traffic to our retail partners. Last year, only in France, we made 3.2 million euros in revenues, generating 1,000 consumer reports and 1 million transactions. Now, we are investing in technology to enter new big markets. The generation and broadcasting of ratings and reviews smart discount coupons, and online advertising powered with artificial intelligence. It's a growing market of 100 billion euros, and brands are looking for solutions to generate reviews and improve efficiencies in coupons and advertising. Our competitors offer individual services, but there is no engaged community like ShopAdvisor, providing independent and reliable information. Our model is very efficient, and we have a strong network effect, creating barriers for competitors. We are profitable and we have monthly recurrent revenues with contracts signed till 2023. With our 1 million users, we have generated 17 million reviews for more than 1,000 companies. And brands trust our community. They use ShopAdvisor reviews in their advertising. We have an experienced team. The three main partners come from C-level positions in Carrefour, Walmart, Unilever, and a Latin American retailer. We are a team of 60 multicultural people passionate for reinventing this industry. We are profitable, we sign a partnership with Carrefour, and the Spanish government is supporting us. Spain, UK, and US will be our next countries, and we plan our first fundraise to invest in technology and expansion. There is a big opportunity to improve this industry by giving the voice to consumers and connecting people, retailers, and brands. Join us in this exciting journey. Thanks. Another fantastic pitch. Wow, the standard today has just been amazing. Uh, thank you, Diego. So we are going to open up the floodgates of questions, and we invite our esteemed uh, virtual panel of judges and in, uh, in La Nave here to raise their hand if they would like to make a question. Do you have a question? Big data, we heard it there. It's big business. They have a million users generating 17 million reviews. What questions do you have about their business model, their future? Raise your hand. Okay, we're going to add, we have a hand up here from our friend Paloma from Waira. Thank you so much, Paloma. So, uh, Waira is obviously a company that deals with a lot of big data, so I'm fascinated to know what your question is going to be. So, take it away. It's a simple question. I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> okay, so I was checking that uh, your business model is B2B2C. So, do you develop apps for retailers? So, how do you go to the market? Well, we have two ways to, well, first of all, thanks, Paloma, for the question and, and the time. Um, first of all, we have two ways of go to market. The first one is doing some uh, 
partners with retailers. So even they help us to recruit people to be inside of our application. We do some services to them directly. And the other way we are doing that, we are launching in Spain now in October, is with a partnership with Balasis, a big uh, coupon company that we are able with them to get to all the retailers and also to many, many brands to join the ecosystem. Thank you very much. Brilliant question. Thank you, Paloma. Wonderful. Um, okay, so I think we are now going to invite some speakers to join us on the stage, and we're going to have a chat a bit more about personalization with some of the leading experts in the field. Uh, so we're going to invite to our virtual screens here uh, the CEO of Fever, which is a really interesting company, Ignacio Basilier. Uh, Juanjo Davidson, uh, who is an ex executive director of data strategy and science innovation at BBVA, is joining us virtually as well. And joining us here in the NAVE is Carlos Ignacio Rojas Duran, who is a mad tech EALA practice and go to market Iberia lead at Accenture, which is a fantastic, that's a magnificent job title. I, I'm getting job title envy, that's pretty cool. Um, okay, and we're going to really explore with our fabulous guests, one in person, two on the screens, and we're going to talk about this amazing world of virtualization. Um, so, um, Carlos, I'm going to come to you first because you're, you're closest. That's wonderful. Um, so, I mean, at Accenture, you have visibility of a lot of market intelligence, a lot of data. It's what you do. You clever people. You make great strategic advice based on all this stuff. How do you see from your perspective, mm -hmm. the personalization maturity of your clients, and how do you think technology can help them along the way of this journey of personalization? Well, uh, uh, companies are trying very hard in, in investing and, and, and paying a lot of money in, in trying to personalize content and recommendation and kind of products and services, but I think, in my opinion, and Accenture is doing uh, a survey every year for more than 8,000 uh, final customers, that the, cl the final client is not perceiving that the companies are personalizing and recommending uh, the needs that they have at the daily basis. So we are getting a lot of data from different touch points from the clients, but technology and, and companies are not yet ready to personalize the, the content 100%. Yes, yes, fantastic. Very, very interesting. And, um, you know, do you think that there are any specific technologies around personalization that you're recommending? Any, any kind of trends or uh, is that really just for clients yeah. to know? Is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it depends on the client and the tech stack that they are working with. Okay. Uh, but there are hundreds, even thousands of technologies that are emerging on this kind of marketing advertising technology market. But it, it is a difficult question to answer, but in terms of uh, I think that is more a culture, more than even the even more than the technology. That every team works together in order to focus on 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 take advantage of this kind of technology, whatever it is, uh, technology, uh, CDP, customer data platform, mm -hmm. DMP, or whatever, in order to uh, work with the different departments of the company and 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 get this data-driven culture in order to personalize the and and understand the the, cus the customer needs. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you very much, Carlos. That was fascinating. And uh, it's a saying that you often hear, culture eats strategy for breakfast, but maybe culture eats technology for breakfast as well. Uh, so we're going to welcome our two virtual guests here, Ignacio, for the CEO of Fever, and Juanjo, who is the Executive Director of Data Strategy and Science Innovation at BBVA. Um, Ignacio, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to start with you. Uh, so one of the things I noticed about Fever is that you've got this fantastic collaboration with Netflix and Stranger Things, and in fact, Fever is often be called uh, a Netflix for experiences. How do you use data for personalization, and what kind of data-driven decisions do you bring into uh, your making your business? Sure. Um, <clears throat> thanks a lot for the invite. Uh, so we think about data, you know, pretty much every minute of the day. Um, you know, we're in the business of entertaining people, and entertainment naturally goes hand in hand with personalization. Uh, we each have different things we enjoy doing based on, you know, what mood we're in, who we're with, uh, what city we're in, or even if we're living in a global pandemic or not, right? So all of these factors have to be taken into account, and we need to be constantly updating 
um, our personalizations across the board in our uh, company. So we use data especially for uh, the three key areas of the business. Our marketplace where we're recommending third party and owned uh, Fever Original experiences. In this case, we look at all sorts of um, user behavior on the platform, similar to what you'd see on a Spotify or in a Netflix. Every single experience on our platform has many um, uh, tags that are defining it, and we're seeing real time how uh, those tags are evolving. And based on that, we make uh, personalized recommendations to a unique user level. Uh, on the other side, we have also our media. So we own some of the largest media in the world related to entertainment uh, through our secret media network. So, you know, we own Secret London, Secret NYC, Madrid Secreto, and this uh, a similar approach is used across over 30 cities. And the reason why those media have become the largest, most engaging media in those cities, um, much larger than any other uh, local media. So on a global level, we're larger than Time Out, than Thrillist, Refinery29, etc. with a fraction of editors. Why? Because we're actually able to know what content to post on our media through Facebook, Instagram, etc. by actually understanding what people are consuming on our marketplace. So, you know, taking that information, uh, creating tools that interpret that information and then outputting certain themes or trends that our editors then use to create content is what means that every single uh, item of content we create generates a lot of engagement. Um, and then lastly, on the originals front, uh, these uh, co-productions that we do, you just mentioned the one we launched in LA a few weeks ago. So we were able to launch a COVID-friendly experience um, together with Netflix. We, we see eye to eye when it comes to uh, uh, using data for content creation. So we came together and decided to create the best COVID-friendly experience uh, using the crown jewel of Netflix, which is Stranger Things. And in that case, the way we use data is we actually try to understand you know, what different formats would generate most excitement and most demand to the audience in LA during this uh, current situation that we're living. And based on that, we actually come up with secret ingredients that the experience actually needs to um, contain in order for it to be successful. So this is done, of course, um, using many internal tools we've built where almost 300 people in the company, half of them are uh, doing tech related work and the majority of those are dealing with data and personalization on a daily basis. So that experience in LA is a great example of it. We sold over 100,000 tickets in less than 24 hours and it became the largest event in the US and actually in Europe, I think, for the whole of 2020. Fantastic. Thank you very much. That's really interesting. And when I lived in the UK, uh, I used to get your secret London emails and I thought they were great. There was always something interesting in there. So it's amazing to think that that was data driven. Um, <coughs> joining data, combining data with creativity. I love that approach. And uh, moving over to yourself, Franco, from the um, BBVA perspective, could you talk to us a bit about the customization of clients' transactional data uh, to interpret their operations and improve their financial wealth? which I, I guess would be very interesting to everybody watching. Hello, good afternoon. Yes, we here in BBA, we are beginning to, to tackle the <clears throat> improving the financial health of, of our customers. And for doing so, we are uh, using data heavily because we want to give the, our customers uh, a proactive, personalized, and actionable uh, advice. So for doing so, we must uh, know better than, than anyone uh, the transactionality of our customers and, and understand their economy, their needs, and the attributes of, of, of our different, uh, our different uh, because the same event uh, is not the same for different people. So uh, what we want is each uh, customer differently and help them uh, use and, and, and profit from the opportunities that uh, financial opportunities that we see in the transactional data. So this is the way that we are working uh, now in VVA. Fantastic. That's so interesting, Juanco. Thank you so much. So, uh, folks, thank you for joining us uh, virtually, Ignacio and Juanco, and thank you so much for joining us in person, Carlos. Great to see you all. That was such a fascinating conversation. And now we're going to have a chat with somebody from one of the most inspiring companies, one of the real innovators, an absolute icon. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, to welcome to the virtual stage uh, Beatrice 
Reyero, who is the Global VP of Strategy and Customer Insights at eBay. Now, Beatrice is an established, experienced digital and e-commerce executive with a passion for digital transformation. She's currently leading the strategy and transformation team for global eBay marketplaces, working with the global marketplaces leadership team to define and implement many of eBay's strategic priorities, including new business models. We are delighted to have you join us today. Beatrice, welcome to South Summit 2020. Hola, bienvenidos. Hola, <laughs> thanks for having me. Oh, lovely to meet you virtually. Um, so I, I had a few questions. Uh, one of the things that struck me very much in terms of data to come out of the pandemic was a study by McKinsey, and their analysis found that e-commerce grew more in 90 days in the spring of 2020 than it did over the previous 10 years. So it really has changed things. And when you think about people being in a lockdown, um, you know, they're gonna do things differently. So I'm just curious uh, to start with, what did you see at eBay in terms of changing consumer behavior? You know, were folks kind of selling things that they needed to get rid of? Were they buying different things? What did you see? Yeah, I, I think a big part of what we have seen is similar to other e-commerce players, which is people really buying things that they need in confinement. So a lot of furniture for, for, for home and for the office that they needed to have at home, sport articles, entertainment, do-it-yourself, electronic, um, people has really done a lot of buying to, to, to make it easier um, to spend the confinement at home. And I think that is being general um, across uh, uh, e-commerce platforms and countries, uh, which is great because I think a lot of people has tried for the first time in some cases to, to buy this type of big ticket items um, through the internet and you know realize that, that that's a way in which things can be done. Uh, and of course, uh, in eBay in particular, uh, we have been also uh, a big market for, for C2C use items. We also seen a lot of people after spending a lot of time at home realizing that there are a lot of things that they also can dispose and, you know, enter into, into that type of uh, different e-commerce. Yes, wonderful. I, I mean, uh, obviously, you see a lot of what your friends are posting on social media, and a lot of my friends are uh, fans of uh, soul music from the 1960s and 70s, and a lot of them <laughs> spent a lot of time on eBay buying really, you know, big ticket items, like you say. Um, so obviously, that's you know, my friends are of a certain age. They're they're not by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> they're, they're Gen Xers, but Gen Zs. Uh, Gen Zers, the Zoomers, um, actually behave very differently. I'm curious to hear your perspective on what Gen Z, the Zoomers and the Gen Zs are doing uh, on eBay and with e-commerce in general. Uh, how are they so different? So, so I think Gen Z is the first generation of digital natives. So they really are people that were born uh, full into the internet. Uh, and that makes them a very interesting but difficult target, really. They are, they are very, very connected. Um, you know, an interesting piece of data, they spend on average seven hours a week on social media only watching video. So that is going to change a lot um, how e-commerce is going to have to be done in the future. Um, you know, the people that really, really trust influencers 40% of them really rely on what an influencer um, tells them on these videos to make a purchase. Um, so very connected, very into social media, much more into the circular economy. So, uh, you know, 40% of them, for instance, they, they, they buy already used items and, and they can recycle and give a second life to, to what they buy. That's, that's part of what they really want to do. They look more uh, for more authentic, brands that you know resonate with their beliefs uh, so a lot of interesting opportunities but they also are used to and really expect a frictionless experience and that's where it becomes difficult right like they have an attention span of eight seconds <laughs> they really used to get really quick stories on videos and so on eight seconds so 
most of them do not have any tolerance for a slow downloading or difficult, you know, browsing and so on. So interesting, different and difficult. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, that's so interesting. So th thank you for joining us, Beatrice. That was a fascinating look under the hood of the future of e-commerce, what the Gen Zs are doing, and what's happening in D2C marketplace like eBay. That's so influential, so famous. And uh, I know that everybody I know uses eBay. So it's great to, uh, to chat with you. And thank you so much for joining us. Um, okay, so Thank now you. we are going to move away from the area of personalization to our next block at South Summit Consumer Trends today, which is all about real estate. And uh, the world we live in today, you know, of course it's digital and the search for a home is no different. Shoppers now have apps that allow them to search by location and neighborhood. And searching online maximizes the ability to compare and contrast homes on the market by selected features. Most of this is done before the prospective buyer even talks to a real estate agent. And this is a very new trend. So I've got a few stats that you might actually find interesting here. 81% um, of older millennials, 80% of younger millennials, and 78% of Gen Xers found their home on a mobile device compared to 68% of younger boomers. So that's a fundamental part of how this business is changing. And we are going to be meeting some of the companies who are looking to change that sector. OK, so let's get straight into the next brave contestant for our startup competition. And uh, you know, these startups, there's you know, many thousands who apply every year. Only 100 get through to the finals. And uh, we're seeing the best of the best now. So I really want to congratulate everyone who's got this far. Um, our next hopeful is uh, Inigo de Pascual, who is the CEO of Casum from Spain. And Casum is the smartest way of buying a home when you can't access a mortgage. So Inigo, take it away. Your three minutes starts now. Hello, I'm Inigo de Pascual. I'm here to present Casum, the smartest way of buying a home when you can't get a mortgage. I am introducing you to Paula and Miguel from the outskirts of Barcelona, who have a nice monthly income, but they don't have the savings to access a mortgage. The dream of buying a home seems unreachable, and they have no other option but continue renting. On the other hand, we have investors interested in residential rental market. However, they identify some obstacles. The main is finding stable and reliable tenants, and additionally, to manage the whole process. The objective of Casum is that couples like Miguel and Paula can start buying a home. We let them do it with a gradual ownership model that works like this. First, they choose their dream home, and they start by buying the part they can afford with a minimum of 5%. The rest is bought by an investor from our network. Once the home is bought, they move. And if they have purchased a 5%, they will pay a rent for the remaining 95%. On top of the rent, customers can buy the rest little by little at their convenience. Casum takes care of all the process, from the purchase and daily management to the resolution of the joint property ownership in maximum seven years. In return, Casum receives from investors a purchase fee and a management fee. Casum offers to its customer an intermediate solution between traditional rent and mortgages. And it's better than traditional rent because they are co-owners from day one. They pay a rent below the market price. And by reinvesting the savings, they shorten the time to get a mortgage. They can also choose from 10 times more available homes. And also, Casum has a flexible model. There is no debt involved, since there is no obligation of buying more. For an investor, Casum is better than traditional rent because the guarantees are much higher. The initial purchase of the tenant acts as a guarantee in case of default. So in this way, investors can assume the risk of investing in higher yield areas. Tenants will take care of the home as owners. There are no vacancy periods, and tenants pay from day one. And Casum takes care of all the process. And on top of the economics, it's important to underline the great social impact of this initiative. The addressable market for Casum in Spain are 1.3 million households that are renting now, but they have the intention of buying in the next five years. Several models like Casum have been launched recently. They already have the backing to purchase flats of relevant investors like Alliance, Credit Suisse, BlackRock, and Morgan Stanley. Finally, I am presenting our team, who has broad experience in successful startups and in real estate. Casum is launched within Nucleo Venture Builder. Being here is an important milestone for Casum that encourages us to continue working to help more couples like Paul and Miguel to reach their dream of buying a house. If you are interested in investing in high yield renters with premium guarantees, feel free to contact us. Thank you very much. 
Excellent. Thank you, Inigo, and to Paula and Miguel, your uh, lovely couple who are using your platform to buy a house. Okay, do we have any questions from our amazing, amazing wall, our wonder wall of judges? Uh, feel free to put your hand up. Yeah, just a, a little moonwalk there. Feel free to put your hand up if you have a question either in La Nave or in our virtual wall here of fantastic judges. I thought that was a really, really interesting product, uh, personally. And, you know, like many of the startups here, you're really trying to find uh, solutions to improve the world and to uh, affect social change. Okay, we don't actually have any questions. That's really cool. It means you answered all the questions, Inigo. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move swiftly on to our next hopeful, who is Kubi Casa. And Kubi Casa is the most scalable way to acquire property interior data. And joining us, all the way from a country I'm very familiar with, uh, Finland, which is wonderful, is their CE, excuse me, their COO, Jarmo Lumpus. So, uh, Kitos, Jarmo, your three minutes starts now. Take it away. Hello, my name is Jarmo Lumpus. I'm the founder and COO in Kupikasa. Kupikasa was founded in 2015. We are a team of 20 people in various locations. We were selected into Chicago-based Accelerator program in 2017. Last year, we received investment from FPS, who is our channel partner in the target market. We have been a finalist and a winner in various startup competitions and also received awards and nominations. And we have a strong focus in U.S. real estate market. Kupikasa is building the largest asset of property interior data. What's the problem? First of all, Less than 10% of the residential listings have a floor plan. Listing entry is a time-consuming process with no objective data available. Home valuation process is very slow and expensive. Home search experience is poor and there is high inaccuracies in property tax and insurance valuations. Overall, there is a lack of structured, reliable and accurate property interior data. Kupikasa solution enables the fastest data collection from, from property interiors. User takes a five-minute scan with Kupikasa app, and our AI technology processes automatically a 3D point cloud, and that can be further processed into floor plan and accurate property data. Kupikasa app was launched 2019, and it works both in iPhone and Android. The key advantages over the competitors are that there is no extra hardware needed. It is very easy and fast to use, and our customers save costs up to 50% compared to any other method. Right now, Kupikasa app is the fastest growing scanning solution. We have more than 1,400 recurring customers and average monthly user growth is around 20%. Volume of the scans by Kupikasa app has been amazing during the first half of the year. 10% week to week growth while the whole world was in lockdown is pretty unique achievement. Our business model for selling floor plans is transaction. However, the actual property data is sold as subscription and customers are larger real estate companies. Our average annual revenue growth has been more than 60% and this year our total sales will be more than $3 million. Why invest on us? First of all, we have proven the market demand with amazing growth numbers. We are cash flow positive and there is a unique opportunity to build data asset for $150 billion ecosystem. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much. Kitos, Jarmo, as I would say, over in uh, Helsinki. Um, so that was Kubi Kasa, who took us through the keyhole of virtual floor plans. And I was very happy to see they already included South Summit October 2020 on the pitch deck. That was very cool. Uh, so esteemed judges on our virtual wall over here, if there are any questions for Kubi Kasa and for Jarmo, please put your hand up. And uh, judges joining us here in the nave, any questions, any questions? It is possible that that presentation covered all of your questions. It was very thorough. Going once, going twice. Okay, that's it. We have no questions for Kubi Casa. So thank you, Kitos uh, Yarmo, for that brilliant presentation. And now we are going to welcome two wonderful speakers to join us to talk about navigating this new normal, this post-pandemic world that we find ourselves in. And uh, we're going to invite them to discuss navigating the new normal. And I'm going to 
uh, welcome to the stage Alejandro Artacho here in La Nave in Madrid. Please come and join us, Alejandro. Nice to see you. Alejandro is the co-founder and CEO of Spot a Home. <laughs> you have a fantastic logo, as you can see on his T-shirt there. Thank you. Thank you for joining us here in person. Yeah. Lovely to see you. Thank you. And now we are going to virtually beckon our other guest speaker, uh, whose name is Laura, pronounced in the Irish way, I'm happy to say. Laura Gonzalez Estefani, who is the founder and CEO of The Venture City. Welcome, Laura. How are you? My pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Ah, wonderful. Okay, so I'm going to step back and I'm going to let you two talk about navigating the new normal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, hi, everyone. So, so the topic is navigating the new normal. And uh, so Laura and I, we were thinking about, a, um, you know, this is obviously a, a global crisis, but there are going to be more crises uh, in the future. That is something that we all have learned. And, um, and you know, in times of crisis, it's very important to have amazing investors. I'm very fortunate to have many great investors, and Laura is one of them. And uh, obviously, COVID hit us uh, really hard uh, in a spot at home, as the same as travel industry. But then uh, Laura was uh, one of the investors that helped us uh, through advice, as well as many others, because she, she, she has that experience. And maybe Laura, uh, or Laura, yeah. it's weird for me to say Laura. Do <laughs> um, <laughs> you have been in, in multiple sites in different crises? Yeah, so maybe you can share some that. tips. Yeah. Yes, I think I have a, a master's in crisis management. Um, I've been in the dot-com bubble in 19, 2000 years. I've been in the financial crisis in 2008, in the 2011, and now in the 2020. So I guess that uh, for those that are in the entrepreneurial world, investors, entrepreneurs, we know that we're always in crisis. Sometimes it's because of context, as in this situation that we are facing today. Sometimes it is because you have issues with your team. Sometimes it's because you have issues with your competitors. Sometimes it's because you have issues with your product. So um, pretty much I've seen it all. And, and uh, uh, Alejandro and I were thinking about really sharing like, stories of how we've navigated those situations. So for example, as a, as a venture capital uh, right now in 2020, uh, one of the things that we uh, recommend is that we're all in crisis. It's not only that the founders of our companies are in crisis, we as venture capitalists are in crisis too, meaning that uh, many companies of the portfolio are going through their lowest times and we have to be working together and we have to support each other to go and navigate through um, sometimes we feel that it's just um, the people around us, the ones that are getting the hit, but it's all of us. Some of us also, or not in my case, but some others are getting the hit personally because they have family members that are going through the virus and some of them have also lost a lot of people. So it's really a situation that is really kind of like unprecedented in many ways. And uh, our recommendation on how we've navigated with the companies in our portfolio has always been about being transparent, very honest with the teams, with the investors, with yourself, so that we can get it through together. So, uh, Alejandro, tell us a little bit, how are you doing after all these crazy months? How are you doing right now? Well, um, I think, uh, you, you know, I, let, me, let me share a bit of our story in, in transparency. So. Uh, when COVID arrived uh, in, in March, then uh, we are not in the travel industry, we are in real estate, but then um, uh, many of our users around the world, they book uh, accommodation in different cities and different countries, and therefore they need to travel, right? So all of that, it was blocked. So the same that happened with Airbnb, Booking, Expedia, uh, revenue kind of went to zero, and then a bunch of cancellations. So, so by that time, actually, it was our, our, our six-year anniversary. Uh, when that happened, right? So you spent six years building a company, putting everything into the company, putting your health, um, and then suddenly everything is gone, right? So, so they say that suffering is the resistance to reality. And um, so I started to talk with the investors and then um, and shareholders and, and, you know, like first uh, you need to accept reality. And for me, what it was a good exercise, and it was in the very first days of COVID uh, cases, is um, I outlined multiple 
uh, possible decisions, and, and I took the hardest decision that I could take. And the reason I did that is to just remove all fears, and then you, know, you start facing all the other decisions in a different way, right? And my, my hardest decision was actually reducing uh, the cost of the company by almost 80%, that meaning 80% of the headcount, because one of the things that it was clear uh, to us is that a, a pandemic like this, it wasn't gonna be a thing of few months, and in our case, it would take a lot of time um, to recover. And then when you are the CEO of a company, cash, is your own, cash management, is your only job. Before you were doing product, uh, well, helping in product, helping, you know, doing recruitment, doing all, uh, uh, you know, helping out the teams on multiple tasks. But then now your job is just cash management. And, and uh, we were thinking, okay, we need cash for at least two years or even making the company profitable. So that's the decision that I made. And obviously letting go, in our case, 80% is a uh, few hundred people. Uh, that was hard, but then I had the massive support from the board and everyone. And what it helped us out there is, as Laura said, being super transparent from day one. We went to the team, we started to have two all hands per week, sometimes three all hands per week, and being bluntly honest with the, with the company. I think people appreciate that you don't hide things and you are uh, fully transparent, and then you are going through hard times, the same as everyone else. It's not their fault, but then your job is your job, right? And uh, so be transparent. We had to do this process, and then my recommendation is uh, always think in your team because it's not their fault that they have to go, and they have been giving a lot to the company. So in our case, we did public directories and uh, help people uh, place them in different companies and, and do that, and unfortunately, it's something that many uh, uh, companies are doing. Uh, but anyways, having said this, it's actually a good thing uh, because uh, we did forecast very conservative and actually uh, everything is going much better than we expected and our P&L now is much healthier than ever before, uh, better margins than ever before. So actually I'm very happy with the outcome from a business perspective. It's not something that you wished for uh, at the beginning, but then from hard moments, you shape uh, who you are as a professional and in a personal level. And it's, it's, uh, the beauty about the journey is, is the person that you transform yeah. yourself and only going through hardest, uh, through hard moments and pushing yourself to hard things are the, uh, the way that you're gonna grow and your business is gonna grow, right? So I, I leave it to Laura because... <laughs> No, I wanted, I wanted to share, I know, with the spirit of being transparent, uh, you know, um, when I was in 2008, I was pregnant with my second child and uh, eBay, I was working for eBay back then, and uh, eBay was going through a huge reorganization like the one that I thought so had to make because of the context uh, situation, right? And I was one of the unfortunate that I had to leave the company. And in that moment, you know, I love the company, I love my teammates. I love the mission of the business. I was super happy, but the company had to restructure. So there I was. Um, and in that, and the same year, at the end of the year, Mark Zuckerberg came to Spain by, it was on, uh, to a Facebook developers, developers garage organized by Martin Barsavsky in a Teatro Lara in Madrid. And I was fortunate enough as to get interviewed by the team and I was hired. So basically what I, what, what I learned from that crisis was that in the moment, it really breaks your heart and you don't understand why the company has taken the decision, why you, after being such an amazing, you know, super supporter of the business. So the feeling is that sometimes doors close, but there are bigger doors somewhere else going to be open for you. And I'm pretty sure that a lot of the spotties from spot at home that had to leave, there will always be spot at homers for sure. And I'm pretty sure they will do great because they were a great team uh, once uh, they were working with Artacho. So be optimistic, just adapt, you know, being in the entrepreneurial world, we need to know as investors, as entrepreneurs, that things change from one day to the next. Right. And it's amazing to be working in this company, but at the same time, we need to face reality when it comes. So yeah, transparency exactly. and, uh, and honesty. Absolutely. And I think it's very important what, what you said about that, that I, um, I've been very fast and adapting because uh, when you do uh, need to do transformations like the one that we did, 
Actually, actually, it's also a good opportunity to uh, focus on the basics, focus on what makes you strong, uh, leave aside the things that they don't make any difference, and, and really going back to the basics and doing the things that you always wanted to do, but you had the external pressure uh, to, to, you know, for growth um, and, you know, sometimes at all costs, and, and also to reinvent our, uh, yourself and looking at different, uh, you know, for example, in our case, we are seeing parts of the uh, market that are actually growing. So we are going to double down on those and then reinventing ourselves and by being more nimble and leaner. Um, still, we, we have a lot of, uh, you know, our team is very big still. Um, and now, you know, it's all execution, you know, let's talk more execution and start that mode. And then so, so yeah, we got to be super optimistic uh, all the time and more crises will come. But um, Super optimistic. I absolutely <laughs> love it. That's brilliant. What an inspiring way to wrap up the conversation. Thank you both so much for joining us here at South Summit, sharing your insights, sharing your journeys. Uh, a, a phrase that struck me when you were both talking is sometimes the obstacle is the path. Excellent. And, you know, you're both kind of finding your way through it in fine style. Thank you so much, Laura Gonzalez Estefani and Alejandro Artacho. Thank you so much for joining us. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. So now let's move on to our next block uh, within consumer trends at South Summit. And it's an area that's very dear to my heart. As I said at the very beginning of today's session, I used to work in a virtual world with Timo from Small Giant Games. And even though this was many, many years ago, we still had hundreds and millions of users. So the huge potential of virtual worlds was very clear even then. And virtual worlds are predicted to be very big business. The virtual reality market is expected to reach almost 88 million in just five years. And the VR technology market is growing incredibly quickly. It's really gaining widespread recognition in just a few years since its initial appearance. So maybe our last two startups of the day will be the future success stories in this fast moving sector. Let's see as they compete for the South Summit Award in the category of Best Consumer Trends Project. Our next pitcher is Anything World from the UK, represented by Gordon Midwood, who is the CEO and CTO, and Natalie Lambert, who is their head of studio. Anything World is a platform to create 3D experiences with anything you can think of in real time, with a voice-driven interface and applied AI behaviors. So check it out. Here's Anything World. Please welcome to the stage for three minutes of pitching fame. Gordon Midwood and Natalie Lambert, take it away. Hi, we're Anything World. My name's Natalie, I'm Head of Studio, and this is Gordon, our CTO and CEO. Hi, everybody. Um, the problem that we're trying to solve is that it costs a lot of time and money for people to create and animate their own 3D asset. And creators are also limited by whatever they pre-made into their applications traditionally. And we've also integrated voice computing in our platform because it's hard to integrate well within 3D worlds. Um, so yeah, that's why we've created this platform to empower creators to build what we're calling limitless 3D experiences. And what do we mean by that? Good question, Gordon. I will answer it. At a high technical level, what we've created is a cloud-based platform, um, which allows creators to add voice technology if they wish to, to have access to over half a million 3D objects. And crucially, with behaviors added, that's our, our, our special sources that our machine learning understands um, all these models and adds behaviors. So at runtime or anytime, if you're making a 3D app, you can create whatever you like and call whatever you want into it, and we'll supply it and it'll behave naturally within your 3D world. We started with feasibility studies last year and um, we launched the alpha build for this platform back in May. We're looking to launch the platform to the public in mid-September. Well, that's almost now, isn't it? Pretty much. <laughs> so um, over the past year, we've had some really interesting accelerator programs and partnerships with big brands and um, enterprises. We just wanted to tell you a couple of the prototypes that we've been working on. So one of them is the Rabbids Playground with Ubisoft. We also have um, a relationship with Warner Music and developed an app called Sing and Play. Which is a kind of visual karaoke, sing along to your favorite Warner artist and the lyrics kind of uh, pop up and appear in your world. It's kind of silly and kind of funny, but without music, it's a bit dry. We were also in chats with Instagram developing a voice lens so that you can say any message that you like and it's visualized in front of you. And also did a prototype for Facebook, which is a meme creator. So you could text a message to your friend and then that text would be visualized. 
bringing very, very funny and very silly results. I hope that gives a kind of a flavor of the kind of stuff we can cook up to carry on cooking metaphor. Um, the trends that we believe we're well positioned to take advantage of, of are uh, mixed reality coming in a meaningful way, especially if Apple and Snapchat bring out desirable glasses. Uh, the explosion of 3D content, uh, Epic's acquisition of Quixel is an example there. Voice technology being everywhere from phones to homes to cars to toilets. And uh, 5G and edge computing uh, being uh, powering uh, on location experiences when we we're allowed to leave our homes. Um, this is an investor slide with large bubbles that I'm sure you've seen millions of before. Uh, our heritage is in gaming, we didn't say, uh, but we made independent games before this venture. And so that's very much where we're concentrating right now. We have a hybrid business model to allow people to come in on board without worrying about the cost or a combination of subscription and royalty payments, a mixture of Unity and Unreal's approach there. And we're also targeting a 1.5 million GBP raise uh, at the start of next year to help to fund more of this kind of uh, magic craziness. And that is us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh my goodness, split second timing there. Well done. Um, uh, well done, Anything World, Gordon and Natalie. Okay, uh, fantastic, fantastic presentation. As with all of them, I don't envy any of the judges. I think you have some very difficult decisions to make because all the startups are amazing. Uh, we have a bit of time for any questions for Natalie and Gordon from Anything World. Okay, so now we are going to go on to our next wonderful picture, and it's actually our final picture of the day. How exciting. It's been so, such a great day. So much talent here. And our final picture of the day is a company called Cluist. I hope I've pronounced that right. Coming from Spain, Cluist is the first location-based augmented reality platform to play and create adventures in the real world. Please welcome, for our grand finale of the Consumer Trends Pitching Competition, the CEO of Cluist, Eduardo Saldana. Take it away, Eduardo. Your three minutes starts now. Today, millions of players keep catching Pokemon with augmented reality and smart devices. But the moment for a massive augmented reality market is imminent. Thanks to the first of different texts to make AR wearables popular, these devices are about to disrupt the market and change it all. We live in the age of content, in which people feel the urge to create, share, and consume original content on the internet. This tendency of uh, user-generated content and social connection has also reached the video game industry with examples such as Roblox, Minecraft, among many others. The next step is AR user-generated content. The problem is that making the type of content is hard because you need to code to have artistic skills and know how to reach your audience. That's why we've made Crest, the first platform to create, share, monetize, and live interactive experiences in the real world just with your smartphone. It's the YouTube fragmented reality. So, what's the Crest solution? Because you don't need to code at all. Thanks to visual editors, everyone can make their geolocated video game or interactive experiences. You don't need to have artistic skills either, because with our tools, you can create characters objects, or environments, very easily in a few minutes, provide them with a behavior and bring them to life. It's also a complete social network connecting creators and players and making creativity the center of everything. So what can you do with Crest? You can create your own Pokemon Go, your treasure hand, your adventure with characters to talk to, enemies to fight, puzzles to solve, and riddles. You can share that with the community and become popular and maybe make adventures for a living. You can do all this stuff on your smartphone and very soon with AR wearables as well. We're going to start focusing on players and video games and very soon it will turn into a very powerful tool for education, marketing, tourism and more too. So we're keeping it proof because during the pandemic the video game industry grew and AR games such as Pokemon Go or Jurassic World Alive set new income records. Crest is completely prepared to allow users to create and play from home if required. And it's free to play. And we're going to monetize with in-app purchases, a marketplace to buy and sell assets, ads, and positioning the platform together with subscription, big data, and partnerships. We are in a closed beta with thousands of users giving us daily feedback. We're about to open in Spain and very soon in Europe. That's why we just started a funding round of $1.5 million to open in this territory, all set to explore the North American market to gain 10 million downloads and then this retention of 40% 12 months after launch. With this team, we're capable of everything. We're going to change the world and everyone's invited. Cluster and roll. 
fantastic or cluest, as it's pronounced in Ireland. Uh, so do we have any questions for Eduardo from Cluest? Um, I thought that was a fantastic presentation, you know, big ambition, changing the world. We've got those Apple AR glasses coming in quite soon. Um, members of the jury, please put your hand up if you have a question for, uh, for Cluest and for Eduardo. Okay, going once. Ah, oh, we do have a hand up over there. Do we have any hands up over here? I'm going to head over here and head over to our friend Lucia, who's been very kindly asking brilliant questions all day. And uh, so no pressure, but, uh, <laughs> but we're, I'm looking forward to your next question. So um, take it away. Your 30 seconds with Cluest starts now. Which other actors are on the market and what is your difference with them? Okay, Unity and Unreal engines, for example, are professional. So people have to learn how to use them to create AR experiences. Um, but with Blessed, everyone can create adventures. I mean, it's very easy. We use visual models and tools to allow everyone to create characters, enemies, etc. So it's democratizing the content of the creation of AR content. It's yeah. completely different. Thank you, Lucia, for another great question. And thank you, Eduardo from Cluest. So um, we have been talking about virtual worlds all day. So we're going to be welcoming another virtual guest to our wonderful stage here at La Nave in Madrid. Alfonso de la Nuez is the co-founder and co-CEO of Zoom, who's joining us for the closing keynote. So welcome so much to South Summit 2020, Alfonso. Hello, how are you? Hey, all good. It's, uh, it's actually user Zoom, not Zoom. Oh, did <laughs> I say Zoom? I beg make your sure pardon. Make sure we make well, the difference hey, there. You know, <laughs> you know the night. Yeah. It'd be nice to be. It'd be nice to be Eric Yuan today, for sure. Exactly. Maybe that's what they call a, a Freudian slip in investment terms. Um, so I'm a big fan of UX, and one of the statistics that I like to share a lot is that IBM found that every one dollar invested in UX user experience provided an ROI of between ten dollars and one hundred dollars. And Forrester found that investing. Um, it, improving UX on a website can increase conversion rates by up to 400%. So these are massive differentials. But these statistics are years old, at least five years old, and that was all made before the pandemic. So talk to us a bit about the state of UX in 2020 after the pandemic and what it means today. Yeah, I think there is probably quite a few cases of even higher conversion rates and a higher return on investment today, since uh, we believe that uh, every company is a digital experience company. You know, whether you're a B2B or a B2C or a uh, pure.com or a brick and mortar, uh, you're still a digital experience company. That's how most, if not all of your consumers uh, are going to interact with your brand, right? Um, it's going to be through some sort of a a glass, right? Whether it's a, a laptop or, or a phone or, or a tablet or whatever. And so, you know, uh, what, what's, what's, what, what UX and product UX design does is that it increases uh, every, single, uh, every single way that, uh, every single business metric that you can think of for, for you know, for, for digital products, whether it's uh, higher loyalty, uh, um, you know, reduce risk of development, of product development. One of the things that uh, is very popular today is, is uh, develop, um, use agile design and development techniques. Uh, and so uh, doing UX research and UX testing while you're in the development process helps you de-risk uh, the, the development, which is something that you want to do ahead of launching your product, right? So, um, UX research is helping and reduce cost, but then of course, once you're live, if your products find the use, the, the product is is uh, is useful, is easy, and and it's uh, and it's uh, intuitive, then uh, your users are going to use it again. They're going to repeat, and you're going to have uh, lower churn ratios, et cetera, et cetera. Very good points. I'm a, I, again, I'm a big fan of UX product UX design. Um, so. How, in, you know, from your point of view, can product UX design help to deliver this high level of customer experience that modern consumers absolutely demand these days? Yeah, consumers expect easy today uh, versus uh, maybe a few years ago when they appreciated that. But today it's expected because everything they do 
uh, you know, whether it's a, a banking experience or, uh, you know, learning experience or even uh, a product that they may use internally at work uh, or, of course, uh, for fun and entertainment. That's what they're expecting. Otherwise, they'll just go to another to another site, right? So what UX design and UX research can do is ensure that uh, before you launch your product, it's going to meet the end user expectation. And, and end users, sometimes they may be the customers, but they may not be the customers yet. So what you want to do is, is run continuous uh, testing and monitoring of your product uh, during the design process. And then once you're live, so that you can design on data, basically. And, and UX is becoming a bigger portion of the overall customer experience that everybody uh, you know, appreciates and cares so much about. But you know, it's not enough to just uh, collect feedback um, after your life. You know, feedback management is very popular. What UX does is that it comes in a little earlier in the pre-life stages where you can already uh, launch uh, testing campaigns and make sure that you're going in the right direction before you go live. And, um, you know, we've heard there about how UX, product UX design helps improve the customer experience. But what are some of the ways that product UX design can improve things in terms of business performance, more kind of internal factors? Yeah, I look at it uh, with my own product team uh, all the time, right? We're looking at how what uh, research and design does actually impact uh, business metrics, which is what ultimately the C-level executives want to want to hear and want to focus on. So again, back to the point about de-risking the cost of development, that's one of the top ones. Uh, you know, we, we see a lot of investment in design and, and development and engineers, uh, but what if we could have uh, those teams work more efficiently and more uh, focused on what the end user needs? If, there's a, if there was a way to do that through continuous testing and monitoring during the development process, you'll find that uh, you can actually optimize the, the cost of development. And that's one of my top, uh, personally, one of my, my favorites. Yes. And um, but, but then there's, then there's the, as a SaaS business, you're going to be focusing on um, uh, churn and or retention. Uh, and uh, we see that uh, there's a direct correlation between higher UX and higher retention. Absolutely, good UX improves you know, sc scores and metrics across the board. And Alfonso, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Um, the co-founder and co-CEO of UserZoom, thank you so much for joining us for this closing keynote of South Summit 2020. That's been fascinating, Team UX, I love it. Um, okay, so that is actually a wrap for our exciting Consumer Trends Day at South Summit 2020. But do please tune in for our prime time sessions today, which is of course scheduled so everyone in the world, it's a very convenient time for folks everywhere to tune in and hear from some incredible leaders like Nick Cash, Katie Coleman, Carlos Sanz, and many more. So please don't miss it. That's the prime time sessions later. And don't forget that you can also watch some great parallel tracks that are running today, all about fintech and also travel and tourism. And stay tuned to, as we announce the winners of each of our category competitions and each of the nine tracks for South Summit today. And the startup competition winners in each category will compete for the grand prize to be the final winner of South Summit 2020. And it will be announced this afternoon at the end of prime time. There can only be one. That's so exciting. I'm thrilled to see who that that's going to be. Um, I would just like to take a moment to say thank you to all of our speakers, all of our judges, all of the startups who bravely pitched so brilliantly today, and a special thanks to Marie and the wonderful team at South Summit here for making this all possible. And let's really join together to grow and build this South Summit global ecosystem family and make a difference. So folks, enjoy the prime time, enjoy the competition winners, enjoy the one big winner of South Summit 2020, and of course, enjoy the rest of South Summit. Thank you.